Okay, so today we have the great pleasure to listen to the talk by uh, Eduardo Leandro from UFPE, PE uh, Pernambuco. Uh, and the title is A Survey on Applications of Localization of Real Algebraic Hypersurfaces and Group Representation Theory to Celestial Mechanics. So maybe you need an abstract for the title already. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank, thank you. Just before, before I have to ask uh, to any participant to uh, sh to switch uh, the camera off, please. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jean Pierre, for the introduction. I yes, I kind of made a, a long title. I'm going to talk about and the survey is really not no consigo uh, uh, you know and we will have to tá cortado o som Eduardo acho que Eduardo caiu Levanta. Uh, 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 are you still here? Are we, we didn't we we can't see you neither the presentation. Oh maybe you can share again. Can you see it now? Yes, it's okay now. Is it big enough? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so sorry. Uh, but uh, I mean, I haven't really started yet. I was just uh, showing this, uh, the cover page. Okay, so once again, uh, uh, it's an honor to be speaking in this event. Uh, so I'm going to start with the localization. You know, a classical problem in, in analysis is to isolate the roots of real univariate polynomials. Um, so when, uh, you know, we have a root, uh, X naught, uh, to isolate means, uh, to isolate X naught means to find an interval uh, which contains the root and uh, so that the polynomial does not vanish uh, in this, the interval with the root removed. Um, one of the uh, oldest uh, modern results on, uh, on this issue uh, is Descartes' uh, rule of signs, which basically says that the number of positive roots of a, of a real uh, polynomial is equal to uh, the number of variations of signs in the sequence of its coefficients uh, mod two, and uh, of course it, it's at, at most that number. That's the maximum possible number of positive roots. So, for example, if if we have this polynomial x to the fifth minus two x to the fourth plus five x cubed plus x minus one, it can only have uh, you know it has three variations of signs uh, in the list of its coefficients. So it can have only uh, one or three positive uh, roots. Well, uh, a very important result uh, for me, at least, and for you know, I think those interested in these issues, uh, is this theorem by Lagrange uh, from 1808, where he um, he states that um, if you have a real polynomial with a single root in the interval a B, open interval, uh, you know, contained in the real line with the orange, uh, the semi-positive -pos axis, real axis, uh, real line, sorry. And the, the real part of the zeros of the, the other zeros of the polynomial are not in this interval. Uh, then, um, um, 
then the polynomial that you get by doing this transformation, uh, do the substitution, you know, using this maybe transformation, a, a, B, a plus B X over one plus X, um, you know, just do this change of variable and then multiply by one plus X to the N and power N is the degree of P. I don't think I said that here. That you eliminate all the, the denominators. Then this polynomial has a single variation of signs provided that A is sufficiently close to X naught. So uh, this is actually a, an automorphism of uh, the algebra of uh, complex polynomials. So we have termed it uh, Lagrange's automorphism. Um, so keep in mind this automorphism because that's the key to our application. Well, uh, based on, on this theorem, mostly uh, the mathematician, uh, professor and musicologist, A.G. H. Vincent, uh, in 1834, published a, a paper in the Journal de Mathématiques Pure et Appliquée, uh, la, la premier uh, edition, uh, where he uh, outlined, uh, he actually presents in detail a method for um, isolating roots of, uh, of uh, real polynomials uh, using uh, maybe transformations like um, a sequence of them, you know, it's an algorithm. It's interesting, a uh, historical note is that Van Sant was very influential in the teaching of uh, geometry in Brazil. The late 19th century, early 20th century, he, he has a book on elementary geometry, which was used uh, in Brazil. Here's the cover page of his paper. This is not really the one that he published, published in the Journal de Mathematique Pure Appliqué. This is rather a memoir he submitted, he, he published in the, uh, I think it's uh, the memoirs of, of the Royal Society of Lille. And uh, basically, the, well, the, the paper I mentioned is, is a copy of this. So this is the cover. I got it from <laughs> when I was in visiting France uh, in 2002 uh, with the help of Alain Aubry. Um, okay, so what was our work? Uh, basically, with my uh, former student, uh, Barros, uh, we, ex we wanted to extend Van Sant to real multivariate polynomials. So we considered a, pol a real polynomial on n variables. Sorry for the n again, it's not the degree, it's uh, the number of variables now. And uh, imagine you have a box, um, you know, for applications that we, we've done, uh, usually uh, it's sufficient to consider this context. And then uh, imagine that the zero set of this polynomial is a, is a hypersurface and uh, it does not intersect this box. So it's possible to find a finite covering of the box by uh, uh, boxes of the type uh, that you take a semi-open interval the real line and you you do the Cartesian product to form the box so that when you do the Lagrange uh, automorphism um, on the polynomial where you know I use this notation of the hat on the variable to say that you're going to write the polynomial with coefficients in the remaining variables and the, the variable with the hat is the one that you choose as the variable, the main one of the main variable of the polynomial to express the polynomial in that uh, in that uh, variable or that unknown. So this polynomial uh, for the cover and also for this these boxes, uh, the the resulting polynomial for from the successive application of the applications of the Lagrange automorphism is not going to have any variation of signs, okay? So that shows that polynomial cannot vanish in that box. And then since you can cover the whole uh, big box, this BN, with the smaller boxes of the products of the J lambdas, then that shows that uh, there is no um, 
there's no piece of the hypersurface in the in the bot's BN. And that's useful for, you know, you can imagine that it's useful for applications. You can find, for example, what the sign of the of the polynomial is in the entire box. Um, okay, so and uh, the other thing, the other theorem is this one, uh, which we have also proved that if uh, you, if you have a same setting, you know, a real uh, polynomial on n unknowns and a box B n, and suppose now that there is an intersection, then it's possible to find a finite covering of um, of B n by boxes which now will not be, will have a similar property to before, but some of these boxes actually, you know, when you do the Lagrange automorphism, some of these boxes will have a, a single uh, variation of signs. Uh, and that shows that you should have a graph, like, uh, you know, you can, using the card rule of signs, you have a, one root, and then, uh, and then you have a graph in that variable, which we, you know, up to permutation, we consider to be the xn. And um, yeah, so then you can you can actually identify, um, you know, you can localize. That's what you call localize uh, this uh, hypersurface. And that's interesting too for, you know, applications. So this. Uh, um, this is the reference. Uh, it's a paper we published uh, with Barros, Jean uh, Barros, last year uh, on the Journal of uh, uh, Mathematical Analysis and Applications. There's, there you can find an application to a five plus one body problem, which is kind of a simple application just to give the, an idea of how the te this technique is used. I, I should uh, uh, draw your attention to the fact that this is just an existence. These are two existence theorems for you know these coverings. Uh, um, that uh, unfortunately you don't know how to construct them yet. So it's basically done by inspection. So here is a, a like the first application which was uh, twenty years ago more than 20 years ago uh, when I was studying in Minnesota, Professor Mocco. And uh, to, to, to study the central configurations of this problem, which is, has been known as a kite problem. So I, I assume four masses, for example, to start with on the plane, two masses uh, equally uh, placed, um, you know, equidistantly placed with respect to a line and two other masses on, the, on this line. These other masses are, are uh, we, we, they are parameters. But we use in the central configuration equations, it's possible to write these uh, masses as a function of two parameters. Uh, these, uh, these are polynomial functions. Um, and then, um, yeah, so yeah, so that um, so that you basically actually sorry, these are rational functions, but you can you can uh, you know you can adapt to this, uh, this okay, they are obtained from rational parametrizations and and uh, you know you can exclude the singularities and then. Uh, Basically, essentially, they are polynomial, and um, and and then you want to study. You know, for example, we tried we studied the bifurcations, so we look at the Jacobian of these uh, functions, and then uh, numerically we find this uh, these two curves are the curves where the bifurcations, the values of uh, the masses for bifurcations. And in order to show that this, the curves are like this, we basically use those um, those theorems. You know, we at the time we just guessed that they would work. Um, where you know you have, for example, here you have uh, 
the curve where the, 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 the generate uh, configurations uh, appear, right? And then we check that, for example, the, if you look at the tangent vector to the bifurcation curve, um, you know, which is basically mapping using these two functions, mu and nu to map the p equals zero uh, hypersurface. Sorry, yeah, here's just a curve, um, an algebraic curve. Then you can check that, um, you know, using the these partitions mentioned in the theorem, which I call the von Sam partition, um, you can check uh, how these polynomials behave and, um, I mean, whether they intersect or not, and then you can find the sign for or the, the components of the tangent vector. And from that in, in a few other things, you can, you can actually sketch these graphs and show that they are basically like this, and then count the number of, uh, of uh, central classes of central configurations on the connected components of the complement. So this was like uh, the application I, I said I chose to, to show you, but there there have been others, like um, you know we have studied the rest restricted uh, four body problem, the planar uh, central configurations for those the, that problem, and um, and we have been able to count there too, including counting on the on the uh, on the bifurcation set as well, and I think someone uh, maybe yeah I. I I think I heard that someone has already counted on these on these curves. So the numbers that are missing here are two when you go from one to three, and four when you go to from three to five. And this is, you know, the mu equals nu is a line of symmetry. So, oh, it's another thing that I should mention, right? Is that the convex configurations here? You can check that uh, you know using the first theorem that uh, that there is no piece of the hypersurface of a, of the generate uh, configurations that goes into the region where the convex configurations uh, are. So that shows that the, the their number is constant. It's called is equal to one. Okay, so this is the first part of the talk. I'm going to move now to the second part. It's not going too fast. <clears throat> now, representation theory. So changing gears here to go back to history. Um, in his uh, celebrated essay, uh, James Clerk Maxwell uh, showed that it's possible to model this uh, Saturn rings using a, a big planet with uh, small bodies of equal mass symmetrically disposed on a circle, like forming a, a regular M gun. And, uh, and he, he studied, uh, you know, he did a, a very interesting study of uh, stability here, linear stability. Um, and he used the Fourier, uh, discrete Fourier transform for that. And um, that was a little after Fourier, but before um, other more powerful techniques like systematic exploitation of symmetry, right? But uh, yeah, so then many other people uh, worked on this problem, uh, you know, including uh, uh, more recent works, um, for example, Professor Molko and uh, Roberts, Gareth Roberts and others, and um, but I, we we noticed um, this is this work by the way was started when I was in Canada visiting uh, Manuele Santopretti and uh, Christina Stoica, and uh, I proposed to them to systematize this study and see what's possible to do with it, and then we we well they agreed and we started working on it. But it took me a very long time actually to to finish this project, the systematization, right? 
so um, yeah, only I I don't know like said 2017, I think that's when I consider it finished. And I, my visit to Canada was in 2010, in early 2011. Okay, so uh, how do how does one generalize this uh, model to multiple rings? That was the question. And uh, a first of a remark is that the, the correct the, the, uh, group of symmetry here is the dihedral group, you know, which is very well known, I think, you know, formed by uh, rotations uh, of 2 pi over n about a fixed point and uh, reflections about lines uh, going through that point, you know, which is uh, equally spaced, uh, you know, in the angle. And um, but when, if you reverse the question and you ask what are all the possible finite sets which are, have this symmetry, then you find out that there should be or, or a central body, I, I say A equals zero or one central bodies, uh, B concentric regular n guns, uh, which are either homothetic or pi over n shifted with respect to one another, and C concentric semi-regular two n guns. These are the orbits of the dihedral group, or um, you know, if you think of the action of this dihedral group on a finite set. So the D e n d n fi uh, symmetric uh, so d n uh, symmetric finite finite d n symmetric sets are like this, but you could have an arbitrary number of n gons and um, you know, homothetic or shifted, and also an arbitrary number of uh, semi-regular n-gons. So I tried to sketch here two semi-regular uh, hexagons, and it's not that great, but just to explain, you know, like uh, you have two, you have two uh, concentric triangles which are shifted respect uh, equilateral triangles and then you just cut the tips symmetrically and that's how we produce those uh, semi-regular two end guns well how do you systematically study the symmetry right i borrowed a few things from a book uh, by sternberg uh, which is i think more or less known uh, group Group theory and physics. I think that's the title. So you 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 can uh, start with uh, how do you describe the with describing the description of the displacements, and it basically you take the tangent uh, bundle of R two and restrict to your finite set. And it's uh, it's a simple way, uh, remark to decompose the bundle into uh, bundles tangent bundles to the orbits of the action of the dihedral group. So you take the sections of this bundle and it also decomposes naturally. And you consider the action of uh, the, or the representation of dn as a set uh, of uh, the, in the set of, uh, in the group, sorry, of automorphisms of R2, basically isomorphisms of R2 uh, in itself, and uh, in this representation, which I call sigma, is the standard representation, which is uh, where uh, you have rotations and reflections in the way I just I mentioned uh, short time ago. Um, so we call it the standard representation of the n as a group of rotations and reflections of the plane. And that that uh, representation induces a, a, a representation in the space of a, of a displacements of the of the finite set. So I call that sigma e is like lifting it to the to the space the the tangent bundle, right? And then uh, of the set, and then. Um, and there is a natural way if you introduce some coordinates, you can go to R2n 
And then you have the typical way where this representation appears, which is to just, uh, you know, when you, you apply the elements of the group, you basically rotate the, the finite set and the displacements. The displacements are basically, you know, choosing a, an arrow in each of the, of the vertices, right? To which arrows that are in the, in the fibers of the bundle. Okay, so in celestial mechanics, we consider general um, potentials. So potentials which are, you know, have a real exponent. And um, the, the nice thing is that uh, when you look at the Hessian of these potentials, you know, you can multiply by the masses and uh, you should say that I, we are considering here masses which are, uh, sorry, this wasn't mentioned in the slide, but these are masses, they, they are equal in each orbit. So each uh, regular and gone, each regular, semi-regular to and gone, they have all the same masses. That's necessary for these arguments. So um, then the really important thing is this commutation of the of the isomorphisms in the representation and the Hessian multiplied by the inverse of the uh, mass matrix. This, by the way, extends, this is what allows us to extend the circulant matrices uh, technique that is used by so many people. Well, I forgot to mention uh, Professor Schmidt, Dieter Schmidt as well, whom I, I studied this stuff uh, some time ago. So the use of circulant matrices is actually a very special case of, the, of uh, applying this when you, you only take the cyclic subgroup the, formed by the rotations in the dihedral group. The, the, what happens is that once this is checked, then representation periods allows you to block diagonalize this matrix, M inverse times the Hessian of U gamma. And what you do is, uh, is very standard, okay? It was uh, found I think the first person who found this was Eugene Wig Wigner, the famous theoretical physicist. And uh, he used the uh, um, Schur's formulation of representation theory uh, as it was first developed by uh, Frobenius. So you, you use uh, the reducible representations of uh, the dihedral group to obtain the isotypic decomposition which is um, this direct sum decomposition of the space of displacements. And, uh, and this, this decomposition is invariant by, by um, A, which is the matrix uh, M inverse times the Hessian of U gamma at uh, some configuration, at some symmetric configuration. Now, these azotypic components, you know, this, um, this uh, indices you see here, tau, alpha, phi, psi, and k, they, they describe the irreducible uh, representations. But the isotypic components, uh, they can be further decomposed. And that the composition is A invariant. And that's what really optimizes the process of uh, exploiting the symmetry of uh, the, the symmetric set to study uh, stability of bifurcations, you know. So you do that decomposition and the dimensions of the subspaces you get depend on the, on the number of orbits you have, this A, B, and C. The number, if you have, or you, if you have a planet of the center or not, or if you have a, how many rings, of uh, n-gons, how many n-gons you have and how many semi-regular to n-gons you have. Okay, so th the form of the stability matrix, though, uh, involves two other matrices. One is not a problem, is this the identity matrix, and the, the other is a, 
it's a it's a little problem is this matrix j which is uh formed essentially by rotations by pi over two of each of the of the tangent spaces to the vertices of the or, or tangent spaces to the points of the symmetric set right of your configuration and what J does is it shuffles, um, you know, it interchanges some of those um, as a TP components, which was something that uh, was observed by, by Moko in his paper when he did the study of, uh, of uh, um, actually, I should say that uh, in the case of the, this work of, uh, of Moko, it is uh, actually he gets this this decomposition, but um, yeah, he gets this decomposition for one one uh, regular and gone. And so this is observed there, but it's actually a general fact. And also um, for this uh, these components that I mentioned here, this um, isotopic components that I call BK. They have a, an additional uh, decomposition um, in two. Okay, before you, I mean, these two decompositions, the, these two components actually are also A invariant. And uh, in the case of the end one, they were found before. Um, I should say that um, uh, the, the have some structures in in the space of displacements um, like uh, the mass inner product is defined here it's just uh, basically the euclidean product with the masses as coefficients i'm not assuming the masses are positive though so actually this may not be uh, an inner product uh, well in general it's not going to be it's, it's a bilinear form that we have uh, different signatures and also you can introduce a symplectic form. So using this product and the J matrix. And we check that uh, our representation of uh, the dihedral group is respect this, um, these uh, structures like, uh, for example, you have, uh, you know, it, uh, it's an isometry for this mass in the product. And it makes uh, the, the decomposition, the isotopic decomposition and its refinements uh, all uh, in orthogonal. Okay, and also Lagrangian with respect to the symplectic form that I mentioned. Like if you take this pairwise uh, some, uh, direct sums. Okay, Lagrangian for each, each case here. Um, the basis for each of these uh, invariant uh, subspaces can be constructed explicitly. You can you can even you know try to draw the vectors. That's a very interesting feature of this uh, technique. Um, you know, um, using so using the 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 representation theory offers uh, projection operators and transfer isomorphisms which allow you to find these uh, invariant subspaces, uh, their basis, and, uh, and also to go from one to the other uh, using these uh, isomorphisms. And I mentioned here that it's all based on Schur's orthogonality relations, which uh, the physicists uh, treat with like almost a religious uh, feeling, you know, like uh, when they refer to, it, to them, because really that's the key to all, all of this the Schur's approach to representation theory. And, um, and the basis can be chosen M orthogonal and M symplectic. Um, well, I haven't really done much as uh, applications yet. I mean, one that is finished and like, uh, I tried to, to do it as fully as I could is this uh, to the Rombos family of relative equilibrium. So basically, the Rombos family uh, consists of equilibria such that um, you know you can normalize. I did not um, 
I mean, this semi-diagonal here is one. This one is D. And uh, and then it's, you know, it's not hard to check that for positive masses, D has to go from one over square root of three to square root of three. And when it does that, then the corresponding masses, which have to be equal on opposite vertices, goes from infinity to zero. So we consider that family and we can, we verify that the matrix A, a, which is M inverse times the Hessian is, can be diagonalized. I think it, it, this was actually known before. I believe uh, people like Bromberg knew this because they could fully factorize the stability polynomial. But the interesting thing here is that, uh, well, it's not just the, not just the, the Newtonian problem, it's actually for, for the, arbitrary exponents, even vertices, you can also do it because it's not, the point is not the, the potential, is the symmetry, right? So, and this is a construction that I, as I said, that we do with the projection and transfer operators from representation theory. So we, we draw, you know, the, the basis for diagonalizing the, basically diagonalizing the Hessian, right? And this, these are the vectors we get. And then we can go from like this, for example, here we have a, a displacement which corresponds to a commodity of the, of the rhombus. And we can go from this to this one applying J. You know, remember J takes uh, V tau to V alpha. So it takes you from uh, homotities to rotations. And then you have these other ones which are constructed using the projections and uh, you know, they are M orthogonal. So this, this basis is M orthogonal. And uh, yeah, so then you go constructing them. You have here the uh, horizontal translations, the vertical translations, and you complete the basis, you know, um, using the projections. And um, these are the eigenvectors. Oh, and uh, yeah, so you can always adapt those bases so that they contain the displacements corresponding to the classical symmetries, right? Of translation and rotation and the, the scaling, like the homotopy. Well, and finally here, the, um, the stability results, uh, that's not really representation theory anymore. This is analysis, right? So we have checked that uh, for the rhombus, uh, for any potential greater than, with exponent greater than, well, it's minus one here, which is, uh, actually corresponds to positive potentials, right? Um, but I mean, it's, well, but uh, because I call the potential two gamma plus two. So, um, so this, for these potentials, uh, you have linear stability, then you have instability for, um, for these other potentials from negative seven to uh, minus 1.07, that's, that's actually uh, the largest root of one plus gamma plus one over 16 gamma squared. And you have mixed in the sense that, uh, you know, for all the other exponents, in the sense that some of the members of the family, of the rhombus family are stable and some are not. So, and by the way, this includes, this case here includes the, the Newtonian case, right? And uh, it's interesting that uh, for, um, it's interesting that the Newtonian case, okay, it's unstable, it's, this is very well known, but uh, the possibility of having instability when you have other exponents is interesting from, from the perspective of uh, Mokel's conjecture about the dominant masses. You know, so this shows the uh, importance of the exponent of the force involved. 
and um, and I have drawn some some diagrams here to show you like basically what determines the stability is the is two dis discriminants of the stability polynomial. Uh, the, the stability polynomial factors in in uh, quadratic factors for each of these uh, subspaces, right? But then what you do is you you don't have to worry about the one the eigenvectors that come from um, the classical uh, you know symmetries and uh, scaling. You only worry about the the remaining ones and. Um, and basically, the ones that are are in the subspaces, um, I mean, like this one and uh, this one, they will form a subspace which is invariant. So it's a corresponds to a factor, a quadratic factor of the stability polynomial. And this other one, this 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 displacement, and this one also will correspond to another quadratic factor. So those uh, deltas that you saw in this, that you see in this picture, they are um, discriminant, basically, of those uh, factors. And when they are positive, everything is fine, you have stability. But when they become negative, one of them, then you have instability in the corresponding two-dimensional subspace of the space of displacements. So I, I used here V as a variable, shape variable, which is, is actually, it's not really the same di semi-diagonal. It's the semi-diagonal with, a, I think it's the square of it with a Mavis transformation used to simplify expressions. So I very much like this V as a, as a shape variable for the family of rhomb rhombuses. And uh, the zero corresponds to the square, and the one corresponds to the most uh, flattened rhombus, the most uh, oblate rhombus. rhombus. And uh, so the intervals in red show uh, where there is stability. And uh, basically, you know, what happens is that those intersections with the the vertical axis and the line v equals one, they they keep moving, and that's what uh, is responsible for the change in the stability of the family. So to to conclude, I will show you the references. So for the the general theory, there is this paper that I I didn't manage to publish, and is still hanging there in the archive. Uh, you know, it's from 2017. Um, I can send a copy if you want, but you can also find it there. But the factorization of stability polynomials of ring systems. The ring systems are the, these DN symmetric sets. I think it's a natural name for them. Also reminds us of uh, Saturn and its rings. And uh, in the second paper is about the rhombus family, which is this structure and stability of the rhombus family of relative equilibrium under general homogeneous forces, published in the Journal of Dynamics and Differential Equation in 2019. Okay, so that's it for the talk. I thank you very much. I'm sorry I didn't put a thank you slide here, but that's it. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, are there questions or comments? Uh, do you have any idea why the rhombus should be stable for those potentials? Um, like bigger than for those exponents? Yeah, for the exponents um, bigger than minus one point. Minus one, yes. Well, um, I mean, basically, as I said, you, know, it's, you look at the discriminant. It's unfortunately it's this. Um, I, I, we have to analyze the the discriminants, and um, I have to to look. I had to look at some uh, curves that uh, you know because the 
the discriminants depend on the shape and the, the on the shape of the of the family, right? And the and the shape uh, and the masses as well. And so the masses are are changing, and um, it's not so straightforward. But I mean, the, it's it's an analytical. I, I don't know intuitively why that happens. You know, it's just that. I think the forces, you know, I mean, there's it's like a, the singularity is, is not important when the force, the exponents are positive, and and that more or less goes into the negative domain for the exponents a little bit, and then then it no longer works, and uh, and then that's only for an interval because if you go and the exponent becomes very negative, then it comes back but in mixed form, like some are stable and others are not. Some some rhombuses are stable and others are not. So I don't know, um, I don't understand that. So you haven't destroyed my conjecture yet, huh? <laughs> For the Newtonian case. Yeah, well, the Newtonian's <laughs> still there, right? The Newtonian is safe and sound, right? And, but I don't, I don't know, yes. Um, the exponent is is important, I think. In the, yeah, and the, it's just that really, I mean, those determinants. I mean, this is a good case maybe to exploit because you can be very explicit about everything, you know. So it's some, yeah, it's 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 those discriminants and yeah, and the, and the, the factors, you know. I mean, the, like the worst factor is the one that is associated with the translations, you know, which I think it's something that you notice when you studied one, one uh, polygon, regular polygon, the instability seems to be coming from, I mean, it comes from there, basically. The other, the other subspace is fine uh, most of the time, you know. Um, I should also say that, you know, I don't see a rhombus as a rhombus. I see a rhombus as a, a ring system with two, two guns, concentric and shifted. So I think that's a good way of uh, understanding it for, I mean, seeing it for generalizations. Um, yeah. Other questions? Is there a possibility to use the convexity theorems from uh, uh, the action of Lie groups in your um, in your work? Well, I haven't. You know what? Um, you you mentioned mentioning Lie groups reminds me of uh, geometric mechanics and uh, and that I'm sure all of this is there somewhere. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, there must be, you know, generalizations. Sure. I mean, that's this has been done, I think, uh, by, I think, uh, Golubitsky and uh, other people, you know, who have studied uh, uh, symmetric bifurcations, you know, systematically. And then mm -hmm. they, they have done stuff in the Hamiltonian setting as well, you know. So, but I, I'm not really that familiar with, with it. I, I know also people in France have done it. I don't have the names here. I have the book here, but I don't have the name. The names of applications to study stability and bifurcations of relative equilibria uh, of many diverse systems, continuous or, or discrete, you know. But uh, yeah, so there is a lot of it uh, done and developed. What happened to me was that I, I was trying to understand what uh, physicists and chemists did uh, instead of uh, studying geometric mechanics. And then I I found that I had to study Jean-Pierre Serre and, uh, <laughs> and other uh, Stiefel and, uh, and many others to understand this stuff. And uh, from the mathematical point of view, 
and then to apply it. You know, mm -hmm. that was my path. So it was not through Lee groups. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I'm sure, yes, there's a lot of stuff, very interesting stuff to learn if you go in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it so, was very, very exciting, the contact with the physicists and the chemists, you know, it's very interesting. Um, really hard to understand exactly what they are doing, but they are so motivated, so excited about it that you get you get very involved in trying to understand from their perspective. But this this is really classical in their field. You know, it's from the 1920s, late late 1920s. Other questions or comments? So, thank you again. <clears throat>